Bowl at Olivet Nazarene University. Throughout a section of the Psalms, we have a number of entreaties. Let me read one of them to you for our call to worship this morning. From Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. O God, we have confidence in thee that you'll not embarrass us. You'll not let us down. So we put our trust in thee because you are holy, righteous, good, and loving and caring. Bless this hour in your name. Amen. You may be seated, and Tony Fightmaster is going to come and lead us in our morning hymn. Let's all take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 414, hymn number 414. It's just like his great love.
performing a special in song for us right now. We're gathered here today in the presence of the Lord. We have come to worship and division ignore. Though we may be different and our worship not the same, we must let the Holy Spirit show the power in His name. We are not all the same we must love and work and pray for one another for let you and me if nothing else agree that Jesus Christ is Lord we build up walls around us Doctrines divide, denomination differences can destroy the tie that binds. We must come together in unity and faith, and let's win the world for Jesus and show the power in His name. We are one. Thank you, Brian. Our special guest in chapel today is Reverend Thomas Bailey. Reverend Bailey is a member of the Board of Trustees at Olivet. He serves as District Superintendent for the Northwest Illinois District for the Church of the Nazarene. That's your, the home district for many of you. He and his wife live in Eureka, Illinois. He is not a stranger to uh, university life. He served as one of the chief administrators at Mid-America Nazarene College for several years. And he is certainly a friend to Olivet. Uh, we're happy to have Mrs. Bailey. Would you stand and let us just welcome you to Olivet today? <laughs> this is Reverend Bailey's uh, first opportunity to speak in chapel, and I want you to uh, get to know uh, both uh, Reverend Bailey and his wife. They have a deep interest in Olivet. And he is a gifted uh, preacher of the word. Let's open our hearts and our ears and our minds as Reverend Bailey comes to speak to us this morning. Thank you, Dr. Bowling. It's great to be with you. It's good to be with Olivet Nazarene University. This, without doubt, has to be the greatest Christian university in the world. Wouldn't you say? Olivet. A tremendous thrill to be with you and to talk to you about Jesus Christ, what he can do in your life, and uh, kind of testify for a few moments for what he has done in my life. It's good to be with Dr. and Mrs. Bowling. I believe the Lord led the Board of Trustees to a wonderful Christian gentleman some weeks and months ago 
to lead this great university. And I know some of the finest days lie just ahead. A few months ago, I was driving down the interstate highway, or up whichever perspective you come from. I was going from Peoria to Rock Island, zipping along the interstate highway at about 56 miles an hour, just really tooling down the road. And I pass a semi-truck. He must have been going 55 and a half. You believe that, don't you? And emblazoned along the side of this great semi-truck were these words, fine furniture begins on the inside. I said, wow, that is a tremendous statement. When I was safely around the truck and in my lane, I retrieved a piece of paper and a pen and I wrote that statement down. And I said, Lord, that's exactly the way it is in serving you. Fine Christianity begins on the inside. It isn't a religious garment that we wrap around us to impress the world, but it's this wonderful work that God the Holy Spirit does on the inside of us that cleanses and empowers and fills us that we can live our life in the marketplace, in the university classroom, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, everywhere we go. For the Holy Spirit comes to do a work inside of us that makes us fine Christians for God. There's a scripture that bears this out, and I want to read it for your hearing today. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, here it is again, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us, To him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. I was 19 years of age, the age of many of you, when a remarkable, amazing thing happened in my life. I was raised in the Church of the Nazarene. I love our great Zion. Every time we would have a revival at our church, the evangelists could count on one seeker at least. Tom Bailey. I was there. God gave me a tender heart. I was open to his leading, but I was up and down. I wanted to serve Christ. I wanted to be everything God wanted me to be with all of my heart, but I did not have the inward ability to withstand the pressures of the world. I wanted to. I would come to the altar. I would repent of my sins. It seems like the devil would attack, and I was a yo-yo Christian for so many years, wanting to, but I wasn't able to be what I wanted to be. At 19, a remarkable year, I guess I could say a vintage year in my life, I went to the altar, was reclaimed, forgiven, gloriously converted, but I knew there was something wrestling inside of my being that needed to be changed and cleansed and controlled by the Holy Spirit, I went back to the altar, this time not to be forgiven, for I was already forgiven. But I went to consecrate my life and to be filled with this dynamic personality, the power that could come within my heart and within my life. I shall not forget it. It was a Friday evening. The preacher had preached. It was at a camp meeting. The altar was lined from one end to the other, probably a hundred people praying. But I was there, 
doing business with God. And there I told him, O oh God, you see in my heart that I want to serve you. I want to do your will. I would like to invest this one life for you. I would count it a privilege to be your spokesman, to be your mouthpiece, to share the gospel with everyone who would care to listen. But in my own strength, I cannot do it. I must have the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to move into my heart and into my life to somehow give me the ability to do what I know God wants me to do. So that is the great inner working of God. For really, ladies and gentlemen, it's what's in someone or something that makes all the difference anyway. Consider with me these simple truths. It's the air in the ball that really makes it valuable. It's the oxygen in the air, the life in the body, the light in the bulb, the colors in the rainbow. Isn't this profound? Aren't you impressed? The clouds in the sky, the stars in the heavens, the nutrients in the food, the voice in the radio. How many of you, when you were a child, thought that there were little men inside that radio talking, if you could just see them? The voice in the radio, the picture in the television, and on and on I could go. It's what's in something or someone that makes them valuable, makes all the difference in the world. And let me share with you now for just a few moments what this marvelous Holy Spirit does to the converted heart. A heart who has been given to God, who has been forgiven, when He comes inside of us, this marvelous cleansing that He brings is amazing. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Purifying their hearts by faith. Pure is pretty clean. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He cleanses our heart. Jude and I purchased a bright red 84 Cougar two or three years ago. It was used. Nazarene preachers can afford used cars better than we can new cars, I suppose. But this 84 bright red cougar was really dirty. It hadn't been polished in a long time. The inside looked as though a number of children had had lunch in there regularly. It was dirty. The seats were spotted. The carpets were everything but what you would want them to be. The outside was faded. And I took this bright red 84 Cougar to an expert, to a car care center, and I said, Sir, clean it up. I left it with him. I thought I'd have to leave it there a month, but he cleaned it up in a day. When I went back the next day to retrieve my car and to pick it up, I hardly recognized it. It had been through the buffer, through the shampooer. It was cleaned inside and out. The trunk was cleaned and vacuumed. Everything about it was sparkling. It was like new. It was clean. For it had gone to the expert. And when he was finished, what a job he had done. And my friends, I want you to know this morning, when the Holy Spirit came into my heart, he cleansed my inner being. He cleansed me from the nature of sin. He cleansed me from the love of sin. And He cleansed my heart from the effects of sin. What a tragedy to go through life with that bent toward sinning. With that love, with that hunger, with that want to. Still there having to battle with God the Holy Spirit can come mightily into our heart. And He can cleanse our very being from the love and from the nature of sin. Glory be to Jesus. We do not have to go around our life battling these things. But He has already won the battle. And God the Holy Spirit can come and cleanse our heart in a beautiful way. Not only does He cleanse us as this scripture verifies... But he comes to remove the hatred and the prejudices and the grudges and the excess baggage out of our heart. He comes to place love 
in our soul. The Bible says that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Praise God. How terrible it would be to go through life professing to follow this man by the name of Jesus. And there was inner hatred and strife and discord. God the Holy Spirit can come and root and ground us in love. The Holy Spirit gives us the wherewithal to resist hatred. Those who have hurt you, this marvelous person by the name of the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to love them. Those who ignore you, those who seem to enjoy making your life miserable, Have you ever met anyone that seems to be sandpaper to your personality? They just enjoy making your life miserable? Anyone like that? I've had two or three. There does not need to proceed out of your heart hatred and envy. But there can be a love not for what they are doing, but a love for them. Those who've deserted, those who seemingly are unlovely. I thank God that I can stand before you this morning. And tell you when I was 19 years of age, I made the most intelligent decision of my life. I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. And then I invited his dynamic Holy Spirit to come and to cleanse me and to remove all of the hatred and all of the prejudices and all of the grudges out of my life. And give me a love for my brothers and my sisters. And my friend, I wouldn't want to go through life without this beautiful person living there. Thirdly, there's this subject called inner power. For the Bible says, according to the power that worketh in us. Praise God. I've always loved the little story of David. I love that. How David and his big brothers and all those powerful soldiers with all of their armaments, Goliath was scaring them to death. David comes on the scene and with a slingshot and five smooth stones, he goes out to meet a man nine feet six inches tall. The first incredible hulk ever to come along was Goliath. What a man. But David faced Goliath, knowing that the God whom he served was more than sufficient. And I've always loved that story. And I said, God, I'm not particularly interested in facing a giant with a slingshot. I'm not inviting a conflict. But give me the stamina, the strength, and the confidence that when I wade out into life, I will not go in my own strength, but there will be an invisible entity, a power, a person living inside of me that can propel me on. It's not the power of my connections or my personality or my ability or my intentions or my intelligence, but it is the power of the Holy Spirit that worketh in us. I wasn't far from here a number of years ago. My family and I, Tony and Tammy and my wife, Judy, would vacation about every year at our campground at Vicksburg, Michigan. Lovely place. After everything was said and done and the cabins were available to rent, we would rent that. I remember one summer we pulled our boat from the other college at Mid-America when I was on staff there, pulled it all the way to Vicksburg, Michigan, Looking forward to a week of boating and water skiing with the family. We finally arrive. We put our belongings where they should be. Tony and I took the boat and launched it into the water. All four of us, my wife and I and our two children, entered the boat. Tony was about 15 years of age. He was a real hot dog at that time. And we motored out about midway into that lake, just looking forward to a day of frolicking in the sun, having a great time. Tony said, I'll do it first, Dad. So he hits the water. For some reason, if you kick and yell and scream, it kind of helps you acclimate to the water, I guess. Tony was yelling, and finally he was comfortable, and, and we threw him the skis. He put them on. Then we swung the rope and threw it to him, and he caught it. 
he was ready to go. We lined the boat up with Tony. The rope was tight. He was ready to go. His knees were bent at the precise angle. The skis were coming up out of the water. And he uttered this very intelligent phrase. Let her rip, Dad. And I mashed down on the accelerator handle. And with a cough and a sput, the motor died. Never to start again the whole week. I prayed for it. I anointed it. I did everything I could. We were in the water for about an hour, and finally I said, I don't have the touch. Tony was waterlogged. I drug him back to the boat. He got in singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Anything but. He was not too blessed. And I hailed a passing boat as he was cruising by. And I threw him my rope and said, would you pull us back to shore? I did everything I could to get someone to work on that motor, but those Nazarenes up there are not very friendly. No, they're great folk. <laughs> Everybody was gone. And so I parked the boat, and I wistfully looked at it all week long. There was no power there. I thought about that afterwards, and I said, there we were. We were in a real boat. We had all of the paraphernalia. We had it all. The only thing was missing was the power in the engine. And I said, O oh Christ, may I not be like that boat with a powerless engine. I need your Holy Spirit in my heart and in my life, propelling me and giving me strength that when I need you, you are there. Power to speak up. And then even greater power to shut up. Sometime I have needed the Holy Spirit's power more to shut up than to speak up. Power to be cool under pressure. Power to finish the course. Power to admit I need a new touch. And on and on I could go. The power of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a couple more. This is not homiletically correct, but it's the way a Tennessee preacher does it. Inner guidance. That you may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth and length and depth and height. My young friends, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know when the dynamic Holy Spirit comes into your life, there is a spiritual compass that will guide you into all truth, to the right friends, to the right attitudes, to the right persons to date, to the right person to marry. Wouldn't it be great if he would show you that this morning? But he won't. To the right doctrine to believe, to the right church to attend, to the right call of life. God the Holy Spirit knows exactly what He wants you to do. And He knew what He wanted me to do. But what I wanted and what He wanted were not on the same course. And I needed someone to take hold of my life and say, Tom Bailey, if you will allow me, I will guide you through the whys and through the various intersections of life. I will guide you. Praise God. And fifthly, in closing, there's this something called inner victory that's amazing. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Praise God. We can go through life with victory. I no longer had to be an up and down Christian. I'm grateful for every time I bowed at an altar. And I have bowed there since my moment of sanctification. That crisis experience, the moment that I really began to grow in Christ, when it all came together. Oh, what a journey it has been. But I want you wonderful people to understand this morning, when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, He brings with Him a truckload of dynamic victory. We can be troubled but not distressed. We can be perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down and not destroyed. We can live our life with an inner victory raging on the inside of us. The winds might be blowing on the outside. 
Circumstances might not be what you would want them to be. A lot of things change that you would love to see changed. But on the inside can be victory in Jesus. Victory over discouragement. Victory over temptations. Victory over failures. Victory over the devil. Victory over doubt. Victory over negativeness. My prayer is, oh God, don't ever let me become negative. A pessimist. Help me to look on the bright side and say, my God is greater than any difficulty. He is bigger than what's the matter. Praise be to God. Victory over loneliness. Victory over physical problems. And even victory over finance. Oh, I haven't come this morning to preach to you some little truth that I have invented. But I declare unto you, the most intelligent decision that this fella has ever made is when I bowed at the altar, after I had been converted, given my heart to Jesus Christ, said, Oh God, I need your Holy Spirit to come into my life as your chosen did on the day of Pentecost, to strengthen, to empower, to cleanse, to guide, and to be my constant companion as I go through life. And what a journey this has been. And as I zip around the semi-trucks on the interstate, and I read that sign emblazoned across that truck, fine furniture begins on the inside. I say to you, and I say to me, fine Christianity begins on the inside. When God the Holy Spirit comes in us, it's tremendous. When He moves inside of us and takes control, and life really begins at that moment. Praise God. Amen. Have you received and experience all of this he's talking about this morning? You can. Open up your heart. Yield yourself to God and God's Holy Spirit will come in. If God has talked to you during this time this morning, I hope you'll seek out someone today very soon and pray. Will you stand with me, please? Just a word about chapel tomorrow. A young man by the name of Dan Marlar will be here. He's a graduate of Anderson University, a Christian humorist, and he speaks to college students and university students and a system analysis expert from AT&T. And let me encourage you to be here tomorrow. Lord God, don't let anyone go away this day or go through the rest of this day without seeking what we have heard this morning to understand it to know and experience in jesus name we pray amen